Let's take our Bibles and for our scripture reading, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. This chapter is full of warnings for such as we are, who are privileged to sit under the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the warning is that it not merely be a profession or feeling somehow comfortable because we have some head knowledge of the truth as it is in Christ and yet our hearts not having been regenerated by the Spirit and truly drawn to Christ in faith. It gives the example of the children of Israel who had the gospel preached unto them through the types and pictures and promises. You think about that tabernacle initially and then the temple being right there in their midst and everything around it is a place of worship. And yet many did not enter into, as it says there in verse 18, his rest. There is a rest promised to the people of God that rest is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a true rest. In other words, being entirely cast upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work as our only hope. And yet, left to ourselves, this heart would have us look to our own will or look to the works of our flesh in addition to. And that's not resting. Under the Old Testament law, if somebody so much as gathered sticks to start a fire on the Sabbath day, which was the word Sabbath means rest, they were to be stoned and condemned. And you think, wow, that's pretty severe. Well, when the Lord says rest, he means rest. Christ said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So that's why the writer to the Hebrews here in chapter 4 says, let us therefore fear. It's easy to point the finger out there and say, well, you better fear. No, let us. He's writing here to those that are under the sound of the gospel. But let us fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. See, that's what the promise is when Christ says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Many miss the labor and heavy laden part. They just say, well, Christ says come, so I made my decision. I came. But they've never been brought to that point of being completely stripped of any hope. And they continue to labor. They continue to strive and to work. Here it says, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. In other words, they're to the point where they can no longer strive. He says, I'll give you rest. But let us fear, it says, lest any of you should seem to come short of it. Speaking of all of those of the children of Israel that died in the desert, died in the wilderness, they did not enter into the promised land, which is a picture of rest. And it says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. So one gospel for the Old Testament and the New. They, by the Spirit of God, looked forward to the Redeemer who was to come and deliver them by his shed blood on the cross. And we look back, given eyes to see, we look back to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here it says, unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. This is speaking about even now as I proclaim the gospel. There are many hearers. And yet the word preached does not profit them. It says, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. That's what the scriptures call the call of the gospel. It goes out. It's a command to come to Christ and to rest in him. But unless the Spirit of God grants that faith, that word there means persuasion. It wasn't mixed with 
the persuasion given by the Spirit of God in them that heard it. In other words, physical hearing. The problem with hearers is not physical. People have physical ears. It's not physical eyesight. They can read exactly what we're looking at here, and yet, left to themselves, that heart remains dead. There's no work of grace. And he says in verse 3, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, the works, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, they enter in. When it says although, it's, it's more in the sense that just as in creation, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So those that enter into this rest is according to God's dictates. So think about here in verse 4, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, if they shall enter into my rest. How is it that any enter into God's rest. Well, it's according to how God determines it, just like in the beginning of creation. God appointed that rest the seventh day. It wasn't because he was tired, but the work was finished. And that's how any do enter into his rest, where it says there in verse 3, for we which have believed. What is it that the Spirit of God causes those to believe who enter into his rest. Well, they believe that the work is finished, just like from the foundation of the world. The creation was finished, even so spiritually now. That, that's that rest. Because in verse 6 it says, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. Now left to ourselves, none of us would enter in. But this is God's determining. Why do some believe and some don't? Well, God hasn't given eyes to everybody. They hear this message, and yet they continue in their way of works and, and self-will. But thank God it says there are those that must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of what unbelief. Where does faith originate. It's by the Spirit of God. It's the grace of God. Where does unbelief originate? It comes from the heart. We're all born in this world as unbelievers. It's God who must grant us that grace in His Spirit to see our need and to be cast entirely upon Christ and His finished work. But here's the command then of the Gospel. And the gospel is a command. It's not an invitation. The, the writer here is not inviting people to believe. He's just he's plainly telling them that the difference between the believer and unbeliever is that those that believe, their rest was appointed unto them. And those that don't believe, it's God leaving them to their own reprobate minds. People say all the time, I I don't know why God has to choose. Why doesn't he just leave the choice to me? Well, guess what? Every person from the beginning of time to now that was ever left the choice where God just left them to themselves, there's not a one of them that ever came to Christ. And that's why we read here in verse 7 again, he limiteth a certain day. A lot of people think that so long as they're still alive, well, there's opportunity. No. Nope. He limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And when it talks about hearing his voice, that's through the proclamation of Christ. Every time we open this book, it's a declaration of Christ, and his glory, who he is, and his sacrifice. So who will hear his voice? Those that God purposes to hear, but people can't blame God for not hearing. For if Jesus, in verse 8, that's speaking of Joshua. Joshua is the Hebrew 
name for the Greek word Jesus. So for if Joshua here had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? In other words, if a true rest could have come under the Old Testament, but you couldn't. The law cannot give this rest that only Lord Jesus Christ could give. Otherwise, he would not have spoken of another day. So even David, there in Psalm 95, speaks of another day. And so verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest, not to everybody, but to the people of God. Who are they? That's those that God, by his grace, has chosen from eternity and given to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for whom Christ came and paid the debt. That's the people of God. That's why it's called Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. And those that he calls by his spirit. For he that is entered into, notice, his rest, this rest of God that the Lord Jesus Christ earned and established and God imputed that righteousness to them. It says here, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. See the connection between the creation up there in verse 4 and this rest in Christ. If you ask me, what is it to rest? To cease from your own works. How plain and simple can that be? That's the gospel command. Cease from your own works. Christ said, if a man does not take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. What is that cross but to denounce ourselves? Christ said, if a man doesn't renounce himself, he cannot be. It's to renounce any self-righteousness. It's to renounce any self-will, any works of our own. Cease from his own works. And then there's an interesting paradox here for some because verse 11 says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. What it's saying is this is not natural for any sinner to rest, to be utterly cast upon the person of Christ and his work. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. It's not saying get busy entering in, but <clears throat> laboring to rest. Remember, I hated naps when I was a little kid. I detested being told I had to go and lay down for a nap because I was like wiggling and I was going. And, and how many times I had to be told to rest? That's the point of this, to rest. Well, that's the same command that's given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ, to rest. How is it that any sinner is brought to rest in Christ? Well, the very spirit of grace teaches that art that there's no hope in anything else. So the laboring to enter in is to rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Not to rest is unbelief. So all these folk that you know and I know that say they've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet they continue to labor and work and promote their self-will and feel like they've got to contribute in some way to their salvation or final state. They're unbelievers. That's what it says here. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelievers. Unbelief. For the word of God is quick. And where you see the word of God put Christ. This word that we're reading is all about him. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. See, a two-edged sword, it cuts going both ways. And that's what the word of God does. Piercing even to the divine asunder of soul and spirit. The idea here is of a sword which is Christ by his spirit piercing, killing them. Anything that pertains to ourselves and our flesh, even to the dividing of soul and spirit. It's talking here about a spiritual work and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What that means is whenever a sinner is brought under the scrutiny of the 
the gospel by the Spirit of God, it exposes every thought and intent of the heart. That's why we need Christ to be that deliverer because there's nothing good in here. You can only expose the evil that's within. And it says, that neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Do you really want to stand before God with some sort of coordination or cooperation between what Christ did and what you did? I don't. Someone has said that if one stitch of our garment is anything that we have contributed, then the whole thing is unraveled. Well, the very righteousness of God is that which the Lord Jesus Christ worked out. And without that robe of righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ earned and established, God imputed there at the cross, there, everything else it says here in verse 13, all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It's no different than going back there to the garden when Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig leaves. But here's the hope of those for whom this rest is appointed and whom God purposed to enter in and who indeed by his grace and mercy cease from their own works. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Here's our hope. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That profession includes in no wise any will of man or works of man or way of man. To hold fast our profession is to hold fast him who is the object of faith. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So this is where we get ourselves in trouble because we get thinking, well, I know Christ died for sin, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering about this sin or that sin. And it says here, He's that high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted or tested like as we are, yet without sin. Are you telling me that you can somehow work out this salvation in a way that Christ has not already accomplished it? God forbid. That's why it says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, not merited, but obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't know about you, but that's all the time. There's never a time where we don't own and know our need before him. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how simple and plain it is when you're pleased to give us eyes to see. I know that this coming to Christ is not just a one-time act. Faith is not a performance. It's a persuasion that you give to each one to whom you have appointed this rest and caused to enter in that we never look anywhere else but to him who came, lived, died, rose again, and now is ascended on high and seated upon that throne whereby we're called to continually come to him come boldly is not to come presumptuously, but it is to come with that full assurance that your spirit gives that in him is grace and mercy. So I pray, Father, that you would keep us and cause us to rest in Christ and his finished work alone. For that, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in our dear Savior's name. Amen.